I wonder if we today here in America, as Orthodox Christian believers, if we were persecuted, if we were called before courts and judges and asked to renounce our faith, uh, or face prison, or face fines, or face the death sentence, would we do what St. Demetrius did? Would we be faithful to Christ? Would we be willing to go to prison as St. Demetrius was in prison? Would we be willing to die for our faith as St. Demetrius was willing to die for the Lord Jesus? If we were called into court as Christians, I think the most fundamental question that could be asked is, would there be enough evidence to convict us of Christianity? St. Demetrius was born around 260 in the city of Thessaloniki, where his father was the military governor. His parents were secret Christians. Even though Roman citizens, Demetrius and his, and his family were from Thessaloniki, they were Greeks. And there is an extra closeness of the people of Salonika to this native of their city as they are natives. I think it's very important for us as Christians when we're talking about St. Demetrius to recognize that the milieu in which he was brought up in was very anti-Christian. And perhaps in America, we don't understand being outright persecuted in quite the same way. We have a preschool program in our church and the children come into the Divine Liturgy when we have weekday holidays and they give them their own sermon usually. So in the case of St. Demetrius, I was telling them, you know that in those days it was against the law to be a Christian. And if you were a Christian, you would be killed or tortured. And you should see the looks on the kids' faces. They go, oh, gee, it's just a, an idea that is absolutely foreign to them and probably to us. Persecutions in the Roman Empire after the time of Christ came in waves. But at this point of history, when Demetrius lived, the late third century, the persecutions were very heavy and were incredibly intense. Demetrius was raised in a very religious household. His mother and father were Christians, were believers. And yet, his father was the governor of Thessalonica. What, what does that lead us to believe? Well, he was a catacomb Christian. He had to worship and express his faith in secret. And the catacombs were places where the Christians met secretly, underground, in caves, in secret areas, where they would have the liturgy, where they would, they would participate in the Eucharist, and they would pray. And there they could be free of, of being caught and persecuted. And here the governor of Thessalonica was one of them. They had St. Demetrius baptized, again because of the persecutions of this period, he was, the baptism was done secretly in their home. They had a priest come and some of their close friends that were Christian attended the baptism of St. Demetrius. His parents raised them as best as they could in the Christian faith. His parents passed away when he was still very young. Upon hearing of his parents passing, the emperor summoned him to come and visit. He was very disturbed by the fact that this loyal governor Demetrius' father had died. As was customary in that period of time, the emperor, Maximian, offered to St. Demetrius the position of his father. In other words, to be governor. But with that came one stipulation, and the stipulation being that he would indeed have to pursue the policy of persecuting the Christians. And here you have a young man now who's looking at walking into a, a, a cushy job, a perfect position with lots of money. And most young people today wouldn't look past that and would accept the position, accept the money, and really have a good time. Well, Demetrius does indeed take over this position of leadership, uh, but his obedience is not attended to the emperor. His obedience is to Christ. And what does he do? Demetrius does the exact opposite. <laughs> Instead of silencing them, he preaches to them. So he does the exact opposite of the order. And, and that's, it's glorious. I mean, what else can you say? What, what a personality. The greatness of St. Demetrius goes to show that he did not follow in his father's footsteps of the Christian faith. In other words, he wasn't quiet about it where his father was. And this goes to show his trust, his faith in what Christ is. In other words, I'm not going to be silent about something that I really believe in. I'm going to show that this is the true faith and that there's much more and what can anyone do to me. 
It's really interesting to realize that even though he was openly Christian, uh, many converted because of him, and yet he still kept his position. It wasn't until the emperor himself visited Thessaloniki after a great military campaign, coming to Salonika to host a great gladiatorial games in the arena, that problems began for Demetrius. He must have had a difficulty in doing this because he certainly understood that in his disobedience, not only would he set himself up for a fall, but he would tarnish his father's memory in the eyes of those who had served with his father so long ago. I think it can be said with certainty that Demetrius knew that when the emperor discovered what he was doing, that he would be liable to death. St. Demetrius knew what was about to happen to him as the emperor was entering the city. He went and gave a good friend of his, another Christian, Lupus, all of his material possessions because his mother and father had left him with great wealth to distribute to the poor and to those in need. And it's interesting when the lawyer asked Jesus Christ, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus Christ simply told him to follow the commandments. But the lawyer said, all of these things I've done, what more can I do? And it's when the, the lawyer said, what more can I do? That Jesus Christ gave the stricter command, selling everything that you have, giving it to the poor and following. Uh, St. Demetrius is resigned to do these things. Knowing what was to befall him very soon, Demetrius was visited by an angel in a dream, telling him to stay steadfast to Christ, to stay toward the gospel, to keep his eyes and his love directed toward God and that he would be strengthened in his trials. At this point, uh, Demetrius is pretty much called on the carpet uh, by the emperor, and the emperor wants to hear it from him. Uh, is it true? Can this be that one of my trusted, uh, you know, one of the, my men who I had great hopes for, who I thought would be, you know, one of my greatest men and would be coming up in the ranks, has he really done this? Is he, could he be so stupid? Could he deny me in such a, a horrific way? And Demetrius says, yes, it's true. Demetrius is not content to be a catacomb Christian like his mother and father were. He admits it freely and furthermore goes so far as to tell the emperor that the gods the emperor believes in are false. That the pagan rituals and the pagan gods that the emperor himself worshipped were foolish and ridiculous. In his fury, the emperor immediately had Demetrius arrested and imprisoned. I think we need to understand how the emperor would have reacted to Demetrius saying no. The emperor was not used to being told no. The emperor had absolute authority, absolute control. He could tell you, you can leave, you can stay alive, I'll even give you money, power, or he could say, you're tortured, you're killed, you're dead, it's over. Demetrius at this point offers no resistance at all. He doesn't try to justify himself in any way. He spoke the truth and he's willing to pay that price, whatever it was. The emperor had Demetrius imprisoned below a public bath area was one of the prisons of the time, but it had great exposure to others and to traffic that was passing through the public bath area. And at this time, many came to hear Demetrius talk because of his fame, because as a general, he was respected, and they knew what was happening and went to hear him speak, and yet he kept on proselytizing Jesus Christ, even at the time when he knew his death was imminent. So here he is now, uh, instead of fearing for his life, uh, this man is singing praises and hymns. Another young man hearing this becomes inspired by what he hears and what he witnesses from Demetrius. That man, that young man would be Nestor. A very young man, very small and very weak of stature, not a very big person physically. A small, frail, thin individual who had a yearning for the truth of Christ, but most importantly was touched by the example of St. Demetrius, who we know was the athletic, well-built, strong, handsome leader, everything that Nestor was not. And Nestor was touched and looked automatically to Demetrius for leadership. My impression is that Nestor must have heard what Demetrius did. Obviously, he knew that Demetrius preached the gospel to the people. Obviously, he knew that uh, it must have gotten around. It must have been kind of the big news, what happened. So. Obviously, he took to heart Demetrius' message, first of all. Second of all, he probably had the most respect for this man and said, wow, what faith, what courage. 
And it must have been that witness of Demetrius that then said, spoke to the heart of Nestor. Now keep in mind, during this time of Demetrius, this was at the height of our Christian persecution. And part of that is we were the main attraction at their uh, annual, if you will, circus events. Uh, circus is not the circus that we think of, but rather involved uh, various pagan rituals and would culminate with gladiatorial competitions. The emperor had the stadium readied for the gladiatorial games, for the great slaughter of political enemies and especially of Christians. He had a platform built on rather long columns upon which the gladiators would fight. Around the platform, he had spears and other sharp objects. In addition to that, though, as we today have our favorite athletes, the emperor, Maximian, had his favorite gladi gladiator named Laos, who had never lost a competition. He was a monster, a thirio, in a human body. People called him the second Goliath. As part of the entertainment, the amusement, uh, as it would go, they would have to wrestle on these platforms. And of course, they would wrestle Laius. Uh, at the end, when it was time, and he got the sign from the emperor, Laius would then throw his opponent onto the spears where they would be pierced to death. The emperor, while wanting to be entertained primarily, but wanting to entertain the masses, is looking for someone to take on Laius who will be brave enough. And these are the money rewards, the financial rewards, the prize money for whoever decides to take on Laeus. It seems that the emperor now, becoming somewhat out of no board with what may have, may have been taking place, asks if there's anyone from the Colosseum who would like to challenge Laeus in a final duel to the death, if you will. Nestor shouts out, I will, and is brought before the emperor now. Nestor is not much to look at, and the emperor looks at him and says, looking at his clothes, says, obviously, you are poor, and you wish to do battle with my gladiator because you need the money. I'll give you the money, but there's no way you can fight this man. It's, it's, it's laughable. Nestor proceeds to say to him, I'm not here to do battle with Laius for the money. I'm not here for my glory, nor, nor am I here to do battle with Laius for your glory. I'm here to do battle with Laius your gladiator for the glory of God, of Jesus Christ. Maximian, hearing now again about Christ, having just thrown Demetrius, whom he had placed great hope in being the successor, the governor of Thessaloniki, becomes enraged and then says, fine, you shall do battle with Laos. Nestor now, knowing what is going to ensue, seeks out the blessing of St. Demetrius, and he does indeed receive that blessing. Moved, empowered by that blessing, he goes now to the top of that platform and begins his, uh, his combat with Laeus. And within seconds, Laeus was flung off of the platform by, by Nestor and was killed. And Laeus is gorged to death in front of thousands of people and the emperor. You can imagine the silence and how stunned the crowd is that this young man defeated who was known as the Goliath of his day. And the emperor confronted Nestor and said, there's no way you could have won it. You must have tricked your way into this. You must have had some kind of amulet or some kind of trickery. There's no way you could have won it. How did you do it? How did you do it? Nestor said, I did it because Demetrius, whom you have had in prison, Demetrius, whom you thought you destroyed, Demetrius, the servant of the Most High God and the Emperor of the universe, Jesus Christ, it is he who confirmed a, and bestowed a blessing upon me in the Lord's name, and it is the Lord that gave me the strength. No trickery, no trickery, no gimmicks. It was the strength of God in me. The Emperor again, the Emperor again twice now, first Demetrius, and now Nestor flies into a rage, and in order to justify himself, he had to eliminate the evidence. So since his champion was killed by the spear of the stakes, he ordered that the next day, Demetrius 
would be killed by the spears of, his, of the Roman soldiers. So the next morning, as Demetrius is in fervent prayer, the guards watch us into the room with their spears, and Demetrius, while still in prayer, raises his arms, and they thrust the spears into him and kill him as it was wished for by the emperor to be killed as Laius was killed. But the irony, and actually the beauty of it, the paradox of it, I guess I could say, is that he didn't die as Laius died. He did, but ultimately he died as Christ died, uh, because Christ was pierced with the spear. And in Demetrius's heart, he wished for that himself. The very next day after the execution of St. Demetrius, St. Nestor was beheaded. And from that day forward, we remember on the 26th of October, the great memory of the martyr Demetrius, and on the 27th of October, the memory of St. Nestor. Would typically happen to for the disgrace the person who has been executed, the emperor, governor, whatever of the area would order that the body be remained out to be devoured by the animals and wanted. Just as today, it's a terrible thing when, when a person does not receive a proper, proper burial. Back then, too, it was a terrible thing when a person did not receive proper burial. So uh, whenever someone wasn't accorded a proper burial, it was for their humiliation and for further punishment. And those who succeeded them lived on. In particular, in St. Demetrius's case, those Christian believers who were still alive after he was martyred, uh, were, uh, it was the intention of the emperor to humiliate them and to put them back in their place. As Lupus retrieves his master's body, he dips his ring in the blood of St. Demetrius. And he also keeps some of the clothing, the cape of St. Demetrius, which is soaked in blood. St. Demetrius is buried, but miracles happen now with this ring that's been dipped with his St. Demetrius's blood and with the cape that is soaked with St. Demetrius's blood. So Lapis then proclaims this throughout the city about the miracles that are occurring through these relics of St. Demetrius. And of course, Maximian learns of this and has Lapis also arrested and Lapis too then is executed. After the persecutions actually ended, a church was built immediately over the place where the remains, the relics of this great saint had been placed. It was a fairly rich man at one point that was, had a terminal illness, went to the church to pray to this great individual that he had heard of in Thessaloniki. And upon placing his entire body over the tomb or the place that they believed that Demetrius was buried, the man was healed. He was so awestruck by what had happened that he dedicated his immediate attention to the destruction of the little church and the building of a huge edifice, the, the foundations which still remain today in Thessaloniki. Upon digging to prepare this church, relics were found, relics, bones of this saint that exuded myrrh, this heavy, oily, fragrant, rose-smelling substance that many of our saints' bones exude once the bones are discovered. Right away they knew this was the saint. Many miracles were attributed to the relics of St. Demetrius, and today the relics are in the church of St. Demetrius in Thessaloniki. I remember when I was a child, when we went to Thessalonica with my family, and my parents taking me to the church of St. Demetrius, and St. Demetrius's coffin there, and people putting their ear to it, and uh, trying to hear. And it's said that if you hear a breathing or a noise, I believe that uh, you are a person of faith. I didn't hear it. <laughs> My dad did. When you first walk into the church, it is a, a beautiful and magnificent structure. But it's when you go down below to the spot where the saint was buried. You, you can't help but feel the presence of Saint Demetrius. It is a cool, very tranquil spot. And when you know of his life, a very short life, it's a reminder to all that there were many Christians, perhaps even most in the early church, who died at a young age 
They were young men and women, some were even children, whose faith, whose devotion and dedication allowed them to not only go through all that they suffered, but at the end to be victorious. And when one thinks about it, here you had emperors, the most powerful people in the world. There's no one on earth today who has the power that the emperors once had. And it was the, the faith and the struggle of these people, again, many who were very young, that overthrew the, 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 the powerful. And to this day, their faith is alive. We've inherited it from them. And the, and the structures and the systems of these powerful emperors are a thing of the past. And the faith of these young people, of these early Christians, are what we have today. And it's transformed the world. To me, Demetrius is one of the greatest saints of the church. Because although we've had thousands hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions in 2,000 years of martyrs who have suffered terrible deaths. Saint Demetrius was one of the most visible ones and is really representative of a whole class of martyrs that suffered death like that. And the reason it means so much for us today to look at a person like Saint Demetrius is that look at what he threw away. He had everything. He was one of the kinds of people that in today's society we would point to and say, that person has a charmed life, has everything. He was the governor of Thessalonica, the second largest city of Greece. He could have had anything he wanted from personal relationships to unlimited wealth to, to any kind of uh, marriage he wanted to have, really. And he threw it all away for the sake of Christ. Now, if we leave this story and relegate it to the <clears throat> latter part of the third century and say, well, it just happened then. These kinds of things don't happen today. They do happen. Uh, the Laesis today may not be seven foot tall or seven foot five or a strong muscle man. The Laesis today, these monsters in our life that we have to go into the ring and wrestle with are sometimes encountering our own personal fears, our own insecurities, our own doubts. Um, our own shadows and darkness in life, which become even bigger than Laius. And we can do battle, and we must do battle. And this is what the, the church teaches us, that we must do battle and be fortified and take on the Laiuses of our lives. But we cannot do it alone. There is no self-help book in the world that can prepare you to take on these things. We only do it because there is a St. Demetrius today still living and blessing us and giving us encouragement and there is still the Redeemer and Savior Jesus Christ who says you can do it you can put on the fight you can slay the dragon you can you can throw the liaises over your back you can put an, a headlock on him an arm lock you can destroy it by the grace I am there you can't do it by yourself I will be there through me you can do anything Mega nevra to and is kin vinis se fermakon ikul menin haith lo foreta ethni troi And Oh, my God. 